Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you back. Uh, as you know, we're in the afternoon session of the CSIS Global Security Forum. My name is Juan Zarati. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS. I'd like to welcome you to our uh, new headquarters here on Rhode Island. Um, spectacular uh, new center, I think. A real credit to Dr. Hamry and the leadership here uh, for the opening and obviously for this forum. I want to thank Finn Mechanica again for their uh, support. Uh, just some ground rules before we begin. Uh, keep in mind we are live streaming this, so this is open on the record. Um, and uh, what we will do is, uh, as you know, we're, we're set for a discussion from 1.15 to 2.30. Um, what I'll do is lead a discussion with um, my colleagues here and friends uh, for about 50 minutes, 55 minutes, and we'll open it up for questions. When we do that, we'll have microphones to ask you to identify yourselves uh, and then ask a question. Uh, we'll try to avoid what the Italians call aire frita, which is fried air, which is a uh, discussion that leads nowhere. Uh, we're going to try to make this substantive and fun and, and interesting. Um, I'm honored to be here uh, with the panelists. Uh, as you've seen, the topic of discussion is what role should financial power play in national security? In some ways, the question is almost axiomatic. Um, financial power uh, over the course of centuries has always been an element of national and international power. Uh, but I think the core question for us here is what does that power look like in the 21st century? Uh, what does it look like for the United States? What does it look like globally? What are the mechanisms for its use and uh, leveraging? Um, and how should we be thinking about its evolution uh, and its future? Uh, and I can't think of a better panel uh, to discuss these issues. Um, and I am not only honored that they're here with us today, but honored to consider them and count them as friends as well. Let me introduce them. You've, you've got their bios in your packets, uh, but let me just quickly introduce them to um, underscore their bona fides. To my far left is Ambassador Bob Kimmett. As you know, Bob Kimmett uh, has a long and a storied career in the U.S. government. Uh, he was Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, as well as General Counsel of the Treasury, uh, Under Secretary for Political Affairs for the State Department, uh, our Ambassador to Germany, uh, the General Counsel to the National Security Council in the, in the um, Reagan uh, administration. He is currently the Senior International Counsel at Wilmer Hale, uh, and I know is, a, is an important voice internationally on all things uh, related to U.S. Uh, national and economic security. So, Bob, honored to have you with us. To his right is David Gordon. Uh, David, who many of you know, uh, is head of uh, research at the Eurasia Group, uh, also the director of global <laughs> macro analysis. Uh, David, as well, has had a storied career and I've been honored to, to see him at work in the government. Uh, he served as Dr. Rice's head of policy planning at the State Department, also was a head of uh, the management team at the National Intelligence Council, was really one of the forerunners for the global trends series that now have become so popular and important to the intelligence community and to the broader uh, think tank community. So that was a, a bit of David's uh, vision and leadership. Um, he works on all things uh, global and economic, and so we're glad to have him here. Lastly, uh, to my left is Assistant Secretary Danny Glazer, uh, whom I consider to be a very close friend. Uh, we work together at the Treasury. Uh, Danny uh, has had a long and storied career at the Treasury Department. Uh, and is not just the Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes, uh, but has been a leading voice internationally for issues related to financial integrity uh, and the use of financial power, in particular American financial power, around the world. Uh, for many years, he led the U.S. delegation of the Financial Action Task Force uh, and is well respected around the world. And if you go to any capital around the world to talk about issues related to money laundering, financial integrity, uh, transparency, accountability in the financial uh, and economic sectors, uh, Danny Glazer's uh, is top of the list. Uh, so we are really honored, uh, and I'm honored to, to have a group like this with us to talk through these issues. What I'd like to do is, is make this a discussion amongst us and then I'll also including you all. And I want to start um, first, uh, Bob, with you, with the question of how you think about financial power uh, and economic influence in the 21st century. How should we define this and, and how does it then intersect with questions of national security? <clears throat> Juan, thank you very much. It's good to be with old friends in a new building. And thank all of you for participating. We know you had a choice of panels today, so we're flattered uh, that you're with us and, and we look forward to it being interactive. <clears throat> 
CSIS was founded in 1962. That was the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis, right in the depth of the Cold War. Back then, the principal measure of strength and vulnerability was nuclear throw weights. That is, the destructive power that could be delivered by a nuclear delivery system. In the 50 years since then, um, one, we've seen the end of the Cold War, we've seen the post-Cold War period, post 9-11, and now I think we're in the fourth era, that is the post-financial crisis, maybe even called the era of the G20. Uh, and I think the important thing to recognize is in this new era, economic and financial issues and considerations are as important as diplomatic and military. Not on a zero-sum basis, both and, both diplomatic and military, but also economic and financial uh, considerations are important to the conduct of a successful national security policy. And in this new era, a principal measure of a country's strength or vulnerability is sovereign interest rates. So we've gone from, that is, what a sovereign plays to finance its debt. Um, when I was in Germany, Helmut Kohl knew with precision the nuclear firepower we had based on German soil. Angela Merkel today knows with precision what the spread was on the recent Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, or Irish bond auctions. I think recognizing that, we just have to look at national security. Interestingly, a, a uh, term nowhere defined in U.S. law, as it should not be. It should be a dynamic uh, term that reflects where we are uh, in uh, the global security system. But for me, national security policy is the summation of our foreign policy, plus our defense policy, plus our international economic and financial policy, all resting on a strong intelligence base. And I think, therefore, in this new era, the work of tr the Treasury Department and its finance ministry colleagues uh, throughout the world is every bit as important to national security success as the work of state, defense, CIA, and other more traditional national security agencies. And I would just say that <clears throat> there, there are sort of two sides to what Treasury does positive and punitive. The punitive side, you and Danny can speak to very well. Uh, that is the work done on terrorists and other illicit uh, finance. Um, I would say that um, one of the really important things that has been done in the past two administrations is combining diplomacy, both economic and traditional diplomacy, to support this effort with the UN Security Council resolutions that have led to EU directives that have led to more common action on sanctions because ultimately sanctions are only effective on a multilateral basis. Um, but the positive side of Treasury is very important too. Uh, Treasury, both at home and abroad, has lead responsibility for a strong, sustainable global economy that produces what is the greatest enemy of extremists, and that is growth and opportunity, particularly for young people. And I think it's important to recognize that not only as something important in domestic financial terms, but also international financial terms. Two quick examples in the last administration. During 06 and 07, as the military surge was going on in Iraq, we also had an economic surge going on that culminated in a meeting in Sharm el-Sheikh in May of 2007, where Nouri al-Maliki appeared in front of 100 delegations to sign what was called the International Compact with Iraq, which basically conditioned assistance for Iraq, debt relief, technical assistance, in return for Iraq taking measures to uh, solidify its economy, stabilize its currency. Iraq still has many, many difficulties, but if you look underneath it, their medium-term fiscal framework is fairly solid. Again, Treasury was very much in the lead on that. Secondly, um, we were having our weekly um, NSC meeting on Pakistan in November of 2008, um, and I recall Secretary Rice, Secretary Gates, Admiral Mullen, Steve Hadley talking about how difficult the security situation was in Pakistan. I was there at the NSC table, chaired, of course, by the President, and I said, listen, I don't doubt any of those classic security concerns are um, crucial, but Pakistan last night went under two months of import cover. 
import cover is a technical term, that is the foreign currency reserves that you need to cover the imports that you have to bring in. Pakistan's two biggest imports, food and fuel. If food and fuel had been cut off, there would have been riots in the street, the PAC army and others would have gone into the street, the Taliban and other extremist organizations would have stirred the pot and what was already a bad security situation would have gotten much worse. It changed the whole tenor of that conversation to what can we do to address this foreign currency shortfall, excuse me, foreign reserve shortfall that put them on the edge of a balance of payments collapse. and. We did some bridge financing with the Asia Development Bank, of which Pakistan is part, the World Bank, and the first international conference that the new administration hosted was a pledging conference for Pakistan in January of 2009. I say that because, in my view, um, it's time to make the Secretary of the Treasury a statutory member of the National Security Council. Yes, he, and in the future, maybe she, will always be invited. but. I would rather they not be invitees. I'd like to see them as statutory members as a way to recognize, again, that economics and finance are now as core to national security success as traditional diplomatic and military means. Thank you, Bob. And you've been a leading voice on that idea, publishing uh, very strongly on that and other matters, of course. David, how, how would you think about financial power? Um, and perhaps from a U.S. perspective, but also internationally? Sure. So. Um, again, great to be here, thanks to CSIS, and, and uh, I have really fond memories of working with both Bob and Juan and on some very exciting initiatives that, that, that came into play in a very significant way for our national security. So uh, as you said, Juan, uh, I think financial power has always been an attribute of power. It's, it's always been a source and an enabler of other forms of power, both softer forms like diplomacy and harder forms. And at, at the end of the day, there, there's a very direct connection between financial capability, or capability and military power. Uh, and and that, that's a, a major interaction. Uh, but I think that, that in, in the modern world, in the modern world, uh, I think that that financial power in a world of gl globalization, in an interrelated world, does have an increasing role, and it's a role, f frankly, that in many ways is parallel to that of military power. Like military power, financial power is a source of attraction for allies and for neutrals, and a source of constraint and fear for adversaries or for potential adversaries. So I think that, that the, the attractiveness and the fear uh, as, as part of financial power is, is what, what gives it things in common to military power. Of course, one of the biggest differences between financial power and military power is that financial power it is really made up of relationships in markets, expectations uh, by f global financial players, and so it, its use, its use is a lot more challenging and a lot more complicated. Uh, and I do think that that really going back to President Clinton, every administration has tried to to put together an interagency to, to meld financial and economic power with the more traditional forms of power with, frankly, limited impact. I think that, that there's been a learning curve. We've gone up. I think we've gone particularly far in this use of coercive financial power in very particular circumstances, both in the war on terror and then in uh, particularly in this uh, global struggle uh, to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear capable power. So I think that piece of it and, uh, ha has really matured uh, and is the piece that, that is best fit together uh, in the in the policy process, but it's still 
it's still not easy to know how, how to wield. And, and you, in fact, have a debate now of is financial power uh, more important to be husbanded at this moment uh, by putting our domestic house in order at the expense of, of some engagement or abroad, or would that be putting financial power actually at risk? Uh, and so I, I do think that, that we're still really in pretty early days in terms of thinking about the usage of financial power. Of course, I think there's also a really interesting paradox for the United States in our financial power, uh, and it has to do with the problematic nature of our politics. And I would argue that our financial power in a very fundamental sense enables that. And it's in the following sense, that the U.S. remains the reserve currency of the world and the preferred safe haven. Uh, what that does is it, it means that, that unlike virtually everywhere else in the world where political shenanigans face a market cost and, inter and interest rate and other pressures for politicians to come together and do deals, that's absent here in the United States. Uh, and I think we've, we, we've seen the absence of that in our unending budget debates. We've seen the absence of it uh, in, in, in a case like in the summer of 2011, when, when a rating agency down rates the United, downgrades the, the United States and interest rates don't go up, they come down because people begin to worry. If people are beginning to worry, they put the money in the safe haven, we're the safe haven. Uh, so I, I do think that, that the, the reserve currency status and the safe haven uh, nature of the United States as a market and treasuries in particular is an enormous tool. It's an enormous tool. Access, access to the United States banking and financial system becomes critical and that's been at the center of the ability of the Treasury uh, to, to negotiate uh, a, a profoundly challenging sanctions regime for the Iranian government. Uh, but it, it is enabling, it is enabling uh, a, a lot of po political malaise at home. And of course, at the end of the day, if that political m malaise goes too deep, y you can kill the golden goose. And that's, that's the dilemma that we face. Uh, but but I, I do believe that, that the, the U.S., that at, at the end of the day, the, the challenge of the, uh, of the world of the financial crisis, the world of 07, 08, 09, ha has been handled largely in a way that has reinforced the notion of the resilience of the United States, the resilience of American financial power uh, and, and, the, and the, the likelihood of the, the United States maintaining that position. So again, I think that, that we had this, this in, e enormous test, this enormous test, uh, but it, it's one that we've come out of in reasonably good shape. The question of how to use our financial power, how to use it in, in the tr trade, wing and I think now the very close connection between our financial power and our growing influence as an energy producer I think cr creates an external environment that's actually quite conducive to the sustaining of American power and to the leveraging of other, other tools of national power. That's great, Dave. I, want, I do want to return to the question of the financial crisis and what, what that has done to the landscape and the perception of power and influence. The, Bob, your point, the, the world of the G20, I do want to <laughs> return to that. But what I'm hearing from both of you is sort of a, a bit of a bifurcation between the sources of, of financial power, things like GDP, the health of the economy, the reserve currency, uh, then the tools and mechanisms we use to actually leverage that power or, or what tools could be used. Danny, in many ways, um, 
you and Treasury are at the tip of the spear of the use of coercive financial power and influence. Um, maybe that's too simplistic a way to put it or too martial a way of putting it. But um, how do you think about the use of financial power and influence um, and how do you see it evolving? Uh, you, you have great continuity. You served in a Clinton era Treasury Department, a Bush era Treasury Department, now an Obama administration. Um, so how do, you, how do you view this world? Well, thanks, Juan. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting question, and I, I, I say this a lot. It's, 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 it's just a tribute to the work that, um, that we've all done that we're even having the conversation that at a place like CSIS, um, on a, in, a, in a conference focused on national security, you, you have a, a panel that's focused um, on the financial components of this. And, and as been pointed out uh, a number of times, it really has been an evolutionary process. To me, really, the key moment in all this, and, and I'm, I'm glad you and, 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 and everybody has, has mentioned the role that really the very end of the Clinton administration played in all this, because I think it sometimes gets lost. Um, when, when Larry Summers was the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, he was really the first Secretary of the Treasury to um, articulate a role for finance ministries um, in uh, – to, to articulate um, a finance ministry perspective in national security. Uh, before, before Larry Summers was secretary, uh, the Treasury Department certainly had a role, but it was, it was a, a, a subservient role. It was a, it was, we would support law enforcement. We would support uh, uh, the Defense Department. We, we would, if there was a war, we, we, would, we would impose sanctions to support all of that, of course. Um, but there was never a Treasury Department perspective. Uh, what, what Larry Summers talked about was um, – he talked about building a new international financial architecture, and he would talk about pillars of, of that architecture. And one of the pillars that he would talk about um, was, at the time, anti-money laundering. We, it was a phrase we used at the time, anti-money laundering. And, well, it seems so obvious now, but it was, it was actually pretty revolutionary and really, in many ways, led to everything that we're talking about now. The notion that the Treasury Department, uh, or any finance ministry, as a finance ministry, has a, has a, a perspective um, on money laundering that is systemic rather than case-driven, um, and that we have an interest in maintaining the integrity of the international financial system and of the U.S. financial system as a finance ministry. Um, from that systemic perspective, uh, you start to think about, well, how do people get access to the financial system? How can we close them off from that access? Um, and you, and, and that applied initially uh, in the case of crime, in the case of money laundering. Then after 9-11, we started thinking about that in very real terms in the case of terrorist financing. And it was, um, you know, and it was all qu quite successful. So then what you want to, so then sort of as it evolves from there, uh, whatever, the, whatever the issue is, whatever the crisis is, whatever the, the national security or foreign policy um, challenge is, everybody's sitting around the table. And one, you, you, frankly, you... <laughs> You're responsible for this one person more than more than just about anyone. Um, the, the the question would the question comes up. Well, you know, 90, 95 percent of these challenges, uh, 95, 99 five percent of these challenges fall somewhere where you you know the military is 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 not an option. At the one end, you want to do more than just talk. On the other end, who can do something? Well, we're we're sitting here at the church room. We're thinking about this stuff. Maybe we have something to add. Um, and that's all, so then all of a sudden you find Treasury um, applying its tools, both sanctions tools and regulatory tools um, and other sort of more subtle ways that we can influence the international financial sector. Um, in the case of Iran, in the case of North Korea, you know, more recently in the case of Syria, in the case of um, so many things, WMD proliferation. Um, once, you, once you start thinking about it in these terms, once you build this mechanism that we've built at the Treasury Department, um, then you have the opportunity to start pointing it in all sorts of different directions. Um, and then you could start adding value everywhere. Sometimes it's going to be at the center of, uh, of our efforts, as, as, as we found it to be uh, most recently in the case of Iran. Sometimes it's, it's only a tangential part. Um, but there's been a growing recognition, and not just within the U.S. You could see it even within the U.N. Security Council, um, that if there's going to be a comprehensive approach to an international security matter, um, there will be a financial component to it almost 100% of the time. You go Security Council resolution to Security Council resolution, every single issue. The Hariri assassination, there was a financial provision in that UN Security Council resolution. Um, there is a recognition now around the world um, that if you want to address uh, an international security issue, you need a financial component. Um, 
and I do think that's, I and mean, we, we could talk about this more as, as, as we go on, um, depending on, on, on what direction you want to go in, but um, I think this is only going to become uh, more and more important, and I think that the, the successes that we've shown in the case of terrorist financing, um, in the case of Iran, in the case of North Korea, the successes that we've shown um, that if you use this, uh, this, this influence that we have appropriately um, and intelligently, um, it could become a very ind indispensable part of our foreign policy and of, of, of the global community's response to any number of crises. It's a great sweeping introduction from the three of you. Um, I, I do want to pivot from what you said, Danny, because I think uh, much of the ability to, to use the po powers and, and suasion that you've talked about is dependent on the strength of America's uh, economic uh, uh, power and, and elements. Um, and this takes us back to the question of uh, what has happened given the financial crisis in 2008. Um, the U.S. in the post Bretton Woods period has been able to be, be the definer of the rules internationally, be they uh, banking, uh, investment, or money laundering, uh, Danny, uh, to, to reference your discussion. How do we think about American power uh, in this period, and in particular post-2008. And Bob, I want to ask you this in particular, because you lived through it. I mean, you, you led the Treasury and, and the government through this difficult period, and you saw internationally the, the effects. How, how do we think about America's ability to actually use its power and influence in that post-2008 period? Um, <clears throat> let me make one comment first on Danny's uh, comment. If you look at the two sides of the Treasury piece, and I'll just say positive and punitive, I actually think on the positive side, you had people before Larry Summers who were really focused on that. And I think of my boss when I was general counsel and Jim Baker, who really energized what was then the G5, expanded it to the G7. People will tell you it was the high watermark of what was called the policy coordination process, led to the Plaza and Louvre Accords. Um, and um, I would say that we were in the early stages of using authorities available to us in the sanctions, for example, that we put in place against Gaddafi when he uh, and his agents killed people at the El Al counters in Rome and Vienna. And we learned a lot from that, um, not to go into a lot of detail. Um, I think you're right that Larry, in his case, coming out of the Asia financial crisis, the start of the G20, gave a lot more attention than intervening people had to both that side and laid the ground uh, foundation for what was done on the, the punitive side. And, and Juan, this goes to your question. I actually think we're stronger today and better organized on the punitive side, as David said. I think we have to balance that with real active American leadership in the policy coordination process in the G7, the G8, and the G20. And you can do that while focusing on things at home. Baker also got the last major tax reform done in 1986. Uh, there are many other things going on in the U.S., also a complicated political system at that time. Democrats controlled the House. We had the Senate and the White House. I spent Halloween 1985 in the federal courthouse, having been sued by the chairman, Democratic chairman of the House Budget Committee for giving the secretary an opinion saying he could pay Social Security checks in the absence of a debt limit increase. So debt limits are just not the province of the Tea Party. These things have been around a while. Let me go, though, to your point, Juan, and that is, I think that the crisis, which was sort of a mortgage finance crisis in the U.S., which after Lehman morphed into a global financial crisis, was addressed relatively well as a crisis, first by the U.S., and then later by the G20, especially in its summit meetings of November of 08 in Washington, April of 09 in London, and then September of 09 in Pittsburgh. Set up a lot of structures, um, including the Financial Stability Board and others that I think are going to be as important to the future as uh, some of the kind of more traditional national security structures that we've dealt with in the past. But the fundamental point is that the global imbalances that pre-existed the crisis are still with us today. 
twin deficits in the United States, a misaligned currency in China, and low demand-led growth in Europe and Japan. We still have to find a way to get at those fundamental challenges in the developed world and in the sort of emerged developing countries like China, Brazil, Russia, and India. Um, I think the U.S. has a particular leadership role to play there. We're still 25 percent of the global economy. As David said, we're the global reserve currency. And I just think it's important, even in spite of the challenges that we have at home, including political challenges, for us to recognize that that policy coordination process on the positive side of the Treasury agenda is every bit as important as Treasury's leadership on the, the punitive coercive side of it. And um, last point that I would make uh, about our political dysfunctionality, it's not just in the U.S. You mentioned 2011 where we had our near-death experience in late July, early August on, on debt limit and default. Europe had just at that time begun to really address its sovereign debt and banking crisis. And at their critical meeting in November and December of 2011, where they finally made some strategic, tough decisions, the communique was issued at 2.43 in the morning, right? So I think what we're seeing around the world is what I call cliff decision-making. People need to be at the edge before they can take tough decisions because they say, I really didn't want to do this, but I didn't want the U.S. credit rating, I didn't want the euro to fall over the cliff. I'd like to see us back away from the cliff a little bit, be a bit more proactive. And I think that's the point that Danny was making, that in the past, Treasury reacted well to challenges that they came up to. I think all of us, both parties, at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, need to find ways to be proactive in leveraging what I think is our greatest asset, and that is the financial strength that we bring to the table. David, can you uh, key off of that? I, and you did mention in your opening remarks the, the issue of debt. And of yes. course, uh, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mike Mullen, talked right. about the debt itself, right. this fundamental, one of the fundamental issues that Bob just referenced, being a core national security, if not the most important national security uh, concern for him. Um, can you talk about some of these fundamental issues and where that puts us in terms of national security vulnerabilities? Yeah. So. I do think that, that um, I mean, I think in, at, the, at the moment of the financial crisis, I think the, the, the perception of risk in the United States really went way, way up. I mean, I remember in late 2007, Dr. Doom, Noriel Rubini, visiting me at, at my office in, in the State Department when I was policy planning director. And he laid out, you know, 15 steps to the financial crisis and how it was going to come and spread. And he got 14 of them right. But the, the most important one he got wrong, and that was the last one, i.e., fundamental loss of confidence in the dollar uh, and the loss of the dollar's reserve status. And, and of course, that, that's, that's the piece that didn't fall. Uh, I, I, I do believe, I do believe that, that this question, that this question of indebtedness is, is one that for the United States, being the reserve currency and the, the, the safe haven gives policymakers much, much, much more space. And again, I think it's here that, that, I think that, that Financial guys, I think, tend to have a much better understanding than even a lot of brilliant economists. I know most international economists every year would, at the end of the year, sign a thing on the U.S. Uh, uh, debt being unsustainable and we're going to lose our reserve currency status. But, of course, we haven't. Uh, and, it's, and it's not something that happens overnight. That's the good news. And there will be market indicators of this. So we're going to know when this becomes pr problematic. It may become problematic. But I think, I think right now, 
I think right now we we are in a position where where we have a lot of space around those things, and that's why I'm I'm very much of the view with Bob that 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 we we can both play a continuing very robust role in the world while putting things back together at home. I don't think we have to make that sharp a trade-off uh, that a lot of other countries would have to make. Uh, I do think that on this question of U.S. leadership, I think that in the immediate aftermath of the crisis with the cr creation of the G20 in, in the Bush administration, the follow-on, uh, President Obama, I think, really using it very successfully in the first six to nine months. Uh, but I think once, once you had the, the perception of a floor under the crisis that, that international coordination through the G20 very quickly got much, much harder. And I think the fact of the matter is that, that we're in a world in, in which the main financial powers are far less like-minded than they were back in the days of the G7. Uh, and, and that now the, the G20 includes a lot of different elements, countries that think very, very differently about the world. And of course, in late 2009, we, we came up against this sort of practical alliance in the G20 of Germany and China, the, the, the big current account surplus countries uh, and, and their, their desire to, to not move at all aggressively in evolving away from uh, th these kinds of basic uh, misalignments that, that Bob was talking about. So I, I do think that, that U.S. leadership in, uh, has become much more challenging and we're, we're, at, we're at a time in, in which uh, the, the amount of multilateral cooperation that you can get on a positive agenda is harder, it's harder to do, uh, and I think that, that, that that's a fundamental challenge for us. I do believe that, that the, the unconventional energy revolution it, it has the potential to really be a game changer in that regard. And, and, and to be an added increment onto the attractiveness of the United States. I mean, I think you're seeing it already with China, that, that 2011, 2012, the, the big energy story in China was to, um, to look west, right? And they bought up a lot of resources in Central Asia. They became very interested in the Middle East. Now, with, with a lot of instability stirring in that part of the world and with the energy revolution, the practical focus of Chinese energy policy is not looking west, it's looking east. How did they get in, involved and gain benefits from the North American and the Western Hemisphere energy revolutions? And I think that, that will be empowering more broadly for the United States. So I do think that, that a lot of the trends here are favorable, but I think that the world, uh, that the, it's, it's much harder to reach the kinds of consensus that is needed on the positive agenda. And I think that, that it's not surprising that, that we, we have gotten a lot of traction on the more coercive, the punishment side of the agenda. Uh, but my own view is that, you know, I think th that the, the coordinating central banks have been, have been critical in this, the, that basically the, uh, the policy of monetary easing in central banks broadly worked. Getting away from that is I think going to be a bit of a bigger challenge than people realize. And the 
And the impact of that on the world economy, I think, again, is going to pose some challenges for the United States, as we're already beginning to see as a lot of the emerging market countries really run into much sharper difficulties. Because the fact of the matter was, in all of this monetary easing, so much of the money went to the growth zones of the world, and that was the emerging market. Go ahead, Bob. <clears throat> Just <clears throat> on the very last point um, on, on indebtedness, there's a good news story here. Uh, if you sort of put aside uh, the political debate around <clears throat> debt limit continuing resolution sequester, um, our deficit this year is Wait going to be the lowest that it's been, I think, in almost 10 years, certainly since the crisis. Right. Having said that, we still have a debt of $17 trillion, which is virtually 100 percent of annual GDP. Mm -hmm. Servicing that debt right now, for the reasons that David described, is relatively inexpensive for us. It takes up a good piece of the budget, but it's relatively inexpensive. But when rates start to rise, and they will, it's going to take up more and more of our discretionary yep. spending, mm -hmm. making it tougher to find money for other programs, including investment, infrastructure, and things of that sort. And the concern that I have there is, how do we get back to U.S. trend growth of roughly 3%? Right. Our growth between 77 and 2007 was 3.2%. 3 and that's what the economists call trend growth. It's sort of the sweet spot. You're growing fast enough to create jobs and opportunity, but not so fast that you stoke inflation. Right now, there's a missing 1% of growth in the U.S. and in the rest of the industrialized world. We're all meeting our obligations, but we're not creating net new jobs and opportunity. And how we find that additional 1% of growth, I think, is the existential challenge of the next five years. I happen to think that recommitting to free trade, open investment, flexible exchange rates is the way to do it, which means TTIP and TPP, I think, are very important to finding that missing 1 percent of growth as we start to spend more money to service debt as interest rates rise. Before I get to the issue of um, sort of the, the trend that you hear about in terms of de-Americanizing sort of the, the American global order. Um, I do want to come back to this question of partnerships. And, and Danny, a lot of your work is spent engaging in financial diplomacy. So I want to get your sense, uh, for the sake of the discussion, as to where sort of cooperation on, on these financial issues, w whether they're on the coercive or on the positive side, where they're headed and where you see challenges for the work you do and also just generally for the United States. Well, you know, I, I, I oftentimes you, you hear people make sweeping statements like unilateral sanctions don't work. Um, we need to um, everything everything we need to need to do, everything we do in this area needs to be multilateral. I think that that's demonstrably false. I think that's a demonstrably false statement. I do think unilateral unilateral measures works. It's it's a truism that the more you can multilateralize your actions, the more effective they're going to be. Uh, that's that's absolutely true, and that's what that's what our goal. Um, that's what our goal always is, is to make our actions as multilateral as possible. But it's not, it's not the case um, that you can't create important dynamics within the international financial system unilaterally that will tend to isolate the actors that, that you want to isolate. And it's also not the case um, that every multilateral action has to be global in the, in the context of, say, UN Security Council resolution. You could build, um, you could build coalitions uh, that are very effective in addressing certain issues. In, 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 in less than a in, in less than a global forum, um, and and so that's that's what we're constantly trying to do. We're constantly trying to uh, to s sort of set out what our goal is, um, take the take the unilateral actions that we feel are necessary in order to accomplish those goals, um, and then at the same time um, work in multilateral contexts, whether whether it's bilaterally, multilaterally, or globally within the context of the UN, uh, to try to to try to move everybody in the same direction. Um, and I think that, 
I think that we've been more successful at that than maybe people give us credit for. If you look, you, Juan, you mentioned the Financial Action Task Force. For those of you who don't know what the Financial Action Task Force is, shame on you because it's a really, really great organization. <laughs> um, it's the, uh, uh, it, is, it, is the, it is the primary international body that sets standards in anti-money laundering and counter financing and works towards their uh, global uh, adoption and implementation. Um, including through some fairly coercive, uh, uh, coercive, uh, coercive methods. When I first became associated with FATF over 10 years ago, um, it was basically a body made up of Western financial centers. It was very effective. Um, over, over the course of the next 10 years, China became a member, Russia became a member, India became a member. Um, and, and, and each time there was, this, there was a concern that we were going to somehow fundamentally change the nature of FATF. The FATF would become uh, more difficult uh, to work with and the FATF would become less effective. The FATF would become more um, lowest common denominator. It's not been the case. China has been an extremely productive member of the FATF. India has been an extremely productive member. Russia is now the, the, the president um, of the FATF. And we work extremely well with them in, this, in that context. Uh, so you could so there is a possibility of, 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 of with a lot of these countries, uh, if you could find common ground with them, it's 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 quite possible uh, to work with them on these issues in a very productive way. And uh, if you look at uh, again, people come back to to our Iran sanctions program. Um, I think that that's sort of the classic case of of a you know of of an important international security issue that we have tackled through both unilateral measures multilateral measures and global measures uh, through the UN Security Council. But if you take the unilateral, put it off to the side, you take uh, the global, put it off to the side, um, what you're left with is us, is us working precisely with the European Union, with China, with, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, with the G7 countries, with Japan, with South Korea, uh, with Turkey, uh, with, with key international partners. Um, in order to uh, in order to develop a global sanctions regime that's uh, you know that, that's put us in a position where hopefully um, we could get uh, good results from diplomacy. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, I think that there's um, oh and, and I should just say and I'm sorry for joining on I should just say an, an important component of this which sometimes gets lost and what I think that we're Treasury in particular is is is, is good at is it's not just partnerships. Uh, whether it's multilaterally or globally with other countries, but it's what I call our strategic dialogue with the international financial sector, with the private sector, um, and our ability to work uh, with global banks and with banks in other countries um, uh, in order to, um, again, create dynamics within the financial system um, that tend to isolate the people and the, the entities and the, and the countries that, 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 that we think should be isolated. So when you take all of that together, the unilateral, multilateral, global, and our, our strategic uh, dialogue with the uh, international financial community. Um, there's just so many different ways that you could play with that to get, uh, to get, to get good results if, you, if you're sophisticated about it. Bob, I want to come to you on the question of um, these other players, the, the rising powers, the rising economic powers, in particular China, and how you see uh, not just China in terms of a challenge to American power and influence, uh, their rapacious need for energy, et cetera, but also how you think they're perceiving the use of power uh, themselves. Um, you know, the Chinese have started a, a debate internally about the potential use of unilateral sanctions. We've seen export controls with respect to North Korea, which is something we never imagined we'd see. <coughs> so the, these are countries that are thinking about the use of power, some of these coercive measures and positive measures. So I'd like to get your sense of, of how you're thinking about China and the role of these other uh, major international players when we think about um, economic influence. Um. First, I'd, I'd pick up on the point. I think the world is still looking for American leadership, even people who might see themselves as strategic competitors of the United States. Um, Danny didn't give himself and the team at Treasury enough credit for bringing the illicit finance issue into the G20 context. If you look at the G20 communiques that came out since November of 2008, there is always um, a section on compliance enforcement issues. Now, during the crisis, it didn't draw a lot of attention. 
in the G20, we've sort of gone from crisis management through policy coordination, and now there is a real focus on compliance. Indeed, if you look at the last G20 communique, it was much more about the work that Danny's doing or offshore tax havens and things of this sort. And so that is very important, and that wouldn't have happened without the U.S. I think that surprised people when we put that on the table in Washington in November of 2008, but it actually, as you say, has picked up some steam even with countries who would have been initially resistant because they thought we were pointing the finger at them. That's the second point that I'd make. I think we really need to lead inside the G7 and the G20 on the policy coordination process. My concern is that there has been too much public finger pointing um, at people who have economic approaches different than ours. If you want to discuss those, let's do it behind closed doors, make those points very carefully, let them see what the disadvantages are to pursuing that course. Even my boss, Jim Baker, back in 1987 found that it was uh, not wise to criticize in public when he took a shot at German economic policy, as is uh, <laughs> also the case today. And the market dropped 25 percent the following Monday in October of 1987. Uh, policy coordination means take your policy disputes behind closed doors, but let's have the U.S. leadership that's necessary to help us move uh, in a good direction. One other thing I'd mention on strategic objectives. Um, let's not forget that the Secretary of the Treasury is the only G20 finance minister who is not a budget director. Right. Treasury used to run the budget in the U.S., then it became the Bureau of the Budget, and then the Office of Management and Budget. But all of, of Secretary Liu's counterparts run their budgets. So if you want them to support U.S. activity anywhere in the world, whether it be on military, diplomatic, development assistance means, engage that finance minister in that discussion. If you go through defense ministers, foreign ministers, development ministers, it's always an indirect shot to the person who's making most of those decisions. Again, I think U.S. leadership uh, is important there on the Chinese. Um, I think the Chinese are going through um, probably the uh, most historic of their transitions right now. Uh, because it is at once a political transition, an economic financial transition, and a traditional military security uh, transition. I think on the economic and financial side, they have fundamentally accepted that they can only be successful at home by being successful abroad on economic and financial issues. They have a program called Going Out or Going Global. And this means they want their companies, both state-owned enterprises and private, to succeed abroad as well as at home, which is one of the reasons why you see such a significant increase in acquisitions by Chinese companies outside of China. By the way, my personal view is so long as that investment does not uh, impinge on national security, we should welcome that investment. I think we should compete for investable capital, but in return, the Chinese need to start opening their market, playing by the rules, and in most cases putting their companies on a path to privatization. And I think that these various negotiating rounds, particularly in the Chinese case, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but also what we do in APEC, in the G20, um, and in the Permanent Five of the UN Security Councils, the clubs that really matter to the Chinese, we need to say we expect you to be an ever more important part of the global economy. We've got a set of rules of the road. You've signed up to those in the WTO. You want to join the OECD and so forth. We welcome you, but we need you to play by those rules. I personally think it's in their interest to do so. I know it certainly is in ours. Yeah, I just just uh, real quick to pick up on on, on on what Bob said because I think it, it was a, it's a really important point and I I I, I don't I, I guess I don't make it enough but I, I agree that that moment the October G20 communique was was a really important moment for for the work I do and the work we all do in illicit finance um, because I think in the, in the days and in the weeks and re, even the days leading up to that communique there there was it's some question 08. in 08, yeah yeah there was some question as to whether or not um, everyone was going to now walk away from anti-money laundering and look at it sort of as a luxury of, 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 of good times. And now that we were in this uh, financial crisis, 
um, nobody was going to have the time or energy or resources to really devote to it. Um, and um, by, put, by, by ensuring that in that initial G20 communique in October, uh, uh, November of, um, of, of 2008, um, that uh, there was a reaffirmation of the importance, not only a reaffirmation of the importance of AML-CFT, um, but a, a, a linking it very, very directly to questions of financial transparency, which really have become central uh, to a lot of, the, of, the, of both the domestic and the global reforms in the international financial system broadly, and saying that anti-money laundering and, and counter-terrorist financing are a central component of financial transparency. Um, it really institutionalized uh, the work that we did in, in, a way, uh, in a way that I hadn't anticipated would be necessary, but it was very clear at that moment was necessary. Um, and I think that was uh, quite, quite, a, quite an important moment. Dave, on China, I want to get your views. Yeah, just so I think, I think the Chinese are really rethinking uh, their views on finance in a more realistic way. So following 2009 and in 2011, you had all these ch Chinese articles calling for the international community to create a new reserve currency, and they were pretty silly. Uh, I think, uh, and that domestically what they were doing was trying to sort of get to internationalization of the renminbi without doing financial liberalization, and it led them down a lot of dead ends. So you have a, a lot of trade denominated in renminbi, but it's really not important in terms of financial power. <coughs> I think now this government is absolutely committed to a process of financial liberalization. It's going to go in a very staged way. I think they, they realize that it's a very tricky thing to do, but I think they're heading there. At the same time, they've also shifted quite dramatically their attitude towards the TPP. Up until six months ago, they were going around Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand saying TPP is not going to happen, it shouldn't happen, it's uh, a trick by the United States to, to uh, um, keep China down. That's all changed and, and the Chinese are now thinking about their own participation either directly or indirectly and I think Bob's point about going out, I mean that, that's led the Chinese to uh, enter into negotiations on a bilateral investment treaty with the United States. But I think equally important, it's changed the nature of the, of the, of the political economy of investment with China, that as long as it was U.S. firms and foreign firms seeking entry into China, China was going to set the rules and then break them at will. The new world is firms want to be in China, but China wants to be everywhere else. And I think, again, the, the prize for China, because of its signaling impact, it's much more engagement with the United States. That creates an opportunity for, uh, I think, reciprocity in a way that just wasn't there. So is China, I mean, I don't want to, it, it, this is not suggesting for a moment that, that there aren't going to be a lot of tensions between the U.S. and China. The nature of the relationship, I think, has a strong competitive element. But I also think that, at least for right now, the collaborative element on the trade side, on the energy side, and especially on the investment side, is such that it really is a moment of opportunity for U.S.-China relations to go forward. I'm going to open it up for questions, but I do have one more question. Bob, I, I really want to ask you because you have been at the heart of um, not just the, the sort of the strategic thinking on this, but also um, looking at the mechanisms and leverage for both the defensive posture vis-a-vis -vis, uh, financial power and influence, running the CFIUS process, the uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States uh, when you were Treasury, uh, but also thinking deeply in, and publishing on the role of sovereign wealth funds. And one of the things we haven't done uh, as much in this discussion, maybe we'll get into it in just a second, is talk about the mechanisms of the leverage of power. Um, and in some ways, CFIUS is on the defensive side. 
uh, the use of capital investments, sovereign wealth funds is on the offensive side, perhaps if you think of it simply that way in a binary way. Can you talk just really briefly about how you view those types of mechanisms in this landscape? Sure. I mean, look, at the end of the day, um, the U.S. is still uh, the number one investment location for foreign direct investment. It has been dropping. That is our percent of foreign direct investment. There was a big conference held last week right. on the new Select America program that the Commerce set up, up, Department set up. But fundamentally, people still want access to our markets, whether it be our equity markets, our debt markets, or foreign direct investment uh, acquisitions. Um, Here's the key thing to remember. In an average year in the United States, there are 8,000 M&A deals, of which in an average year, 1,500 are foreign acquirers, and in an average year, no more than 150 go before CFIUS cases. So I always say if somebody wants to talk about investing in the U.S., they should start at the strategic level look at what acquisitions are being made, particularly by foreign acquirers, that do not raise potential security concerns. Unfortunately, the number of cases that go through CFIUS are relatively small, and the great majority of them go through um, uh, successfully, in fact, the vast majority. With sovereign wealth funds, as they became more and more desirous of making acquisitions in the United States, um, a controversy broke out in 2007, right after the China Investment Corporation bought 9.9% .9 of Blackstone's initial public offering. And also the Germans started expressing concerns about what they call Staatsfonds, which translates as sovereign wealth funds. But what they were really concerned about was Gazprom right. buying a, a, an energy company. And so you have to really separate out sovereign wealth funds and state-owned enterprises, even though they're both owned uh, by the state. Sovereign wealth funds went into a process from the summer of 07 through the fall of 08 that resulted in what are called the Santiago Principles. They were issued in Santiago, Chile. And basically, going to Danny's point, they're transparency principles. And those sovereign wealth funds who signed up to those principles are presumed to be investing for commercial and not political reasons. And really, we've had no major debate on sovereign wealth funds since that time. And I think now they see it's to their advantage to be more open and transparent because it creates more investment opportunity. I actually think, though, for state-owned enterprises, both from China and elsewhere, we're perilously close to where we were in 2007, and that is people presume that state-owned enterprises, because the state has made a conscious decision to keep them in their portfolio, are investing for political and not commercial reasons. So I would like to see something akin to the Santiago principles process done on the state-owned enterprise side so that they'll invest more in the U.S., but do it on a, a more transparent basis. Great. Let's open it up. First here, and again, if you could identify yourself, wait for the mic because, of course, we've got people who are not with us physically but are watching or listening online. Thanks, Juan. I'm Will Embry from DynCorp International. Uh, September 11th focused us on international terrorism as a threat to our national security. I'd be curious as to whether you think that the informal financial markets, uh, uh, Hawalas, uh, international crime networks, narco-terrorists, and maybe, uh, maybe even Bitcoin are a, a similar threat to our financial systems? Um, so, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think informal. Uh, when we say when we say informal financial systems, uh, what we what we. Okay, I, I don't I don't think informal financial systems are a threat to our threat at all. Um, informal financial systems. Um, often uh, are the only systems that are available to uh, to bring financial services to unbanked areas, whether um, in this hemisphere and other hemispheres in some countries, a country like Somalia, um, it's basically the only way uh, you could, uh, uh, people say in the United States who have, uh, who have family in Somalia could, uh, could, could, could get money there. So um, informal financial uh, uh, systems, whether it's as you say, Hawala or other forms of uh, or other forms of informal um, uh, value transfer, 
I don't consider to be a threat in and of themselves. What's problematic about them is that they tend to be unregulated and, un, and, and therefore non-transparent. So it gives opportunities to illicit actors, whether they're, whether they're terrorists or, or organized crime um, or whoever they might be, uh, to, uh, to, to use them uh, without, without the opportunity for law enforcement or for others to, to, to trace those financial transactions. And that's why it's so important um, that, we, that we address those, and, and that's what we try to do. I mean, you address informal financial systems in a number of ways. The, 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 the best way to address it is to ensure that f formal financial services are provided to as broad a, a set of communities as possible. That's a long-term generational issue that we work on with governments. Um, this is, gets to the positive side, of, uh, as Bob said, of what we do. We work with the World Bank on these things with the IMF on these things. We work with everybody, with USAID um, on, on these types of things. Um, uh, and then secondly, what you need to try to do is, is, is bring some sort of very, very basic, just very, very simple uh, regulation to them to encourage a little bit of transparency, to encourage their interaction um, with appropriate governmental authorities, um, and then creating a line between what's, what's, what's licit and what's illicit. And then the third component of it would be enforcement. Um, and once you create that line, you can, you can use it to try to go, go after the actors who are, who are, who are not uh, trying to com comply with the rules. So I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the basic strategy we have with respect to that. So so again, I don't think that the, the, that the notion of, 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 of Hawala or of, or of informal um, financial services is in and of itself problematic. The problematic aspect of it is the non-transparent aspect of it, which then makes it up, uh, uh, subject to abuse by people who we, who we wouldn't want to have access to this financial system. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrei Sitov. I'm with the Russian news agency Tartas here in Washington, D.C. Thank you for a great discussion. Uh, I want to take a, a small issue, relatively small issue in the grand scheme of things that uh, you've uh, been discussing. Uh, some people claim that uh, the fallout uh, from uh, Mr. Snowden's uh, revelations will mostly be in the field of economics and business. As, uh, potential repercussions for the American companies. Uh, do you really see a risk like that for, for the American business? Thank you. David, and you generally, maybe if you could comment on this uh, specific case as an intersection between the national security interest and the economic and financial interest. Thank you. No, it's a good question. The, the question of whether or not this is going to start impacting American investment and perception of American uh, Yeah, no, I think it's uh, that, that I, I do think that, that American IT businesses are facing a, a pretty big uh, uh, challenge in terms of their ability to operate overseas. Uh, and, and I think they're, they're all now looking for what can they do to fix this. Um, you know, I, I think that I don't think it's likely to go broader than, than companies in the IT sector, uh, but I think that that U.S. IT companies are very concerned now over this, uh, and I think they they are facing a lot of headwinds and and have have very challenging tasks in, in a lot of places. Yes, right here, please. Uh, Bob Bird, World Academy of Art and Science. One of the things I've been thinking about during this excellent discussion is that maybe the proof of the last crisis was that of a, uh, we're too big to fail. And I think it was the, West, the Atlantic economy that was too big to fail, and I think the Fed was there as a kind of a secret power. And the question I have to ask, I'm happy to have it secret, I like to maintain it, but I'd like to also know whether there are any cracks in that system that you see that need to repair or whether it's just eternally good safety net. Bob, could you take that? Um, <clears throat> well, I think there were a lot of lessons learned uh, during uh, the crisis. Um, uh, some of that led to uh, internal restructuring um, inside both fiscal and monetary authorities in the U.S. Uh, and abroad. Obviously here we had Dodd-Frank legislation abroad. You've had a whole series of EU directives, many others being uh, considered right now. Um, and I, I think at the end of the day, 
what we learned is you really need effective um, coordination and interaction between fiscal and monetary authorities, both during a crisis and beyond. Uh, there's one unique feature of the global financial system right now, and that is virtually every central bank governor in a major economy had served as a senior finance ministry official previously. Now, this isn't just me being proud as a former <laughs> treasury guy, but what it means is they were in senior fiscal positions before. And as now monetary <coughs> officials, they know that they shouldn't get in front of fiscal officials. And they also, I think, are in a position to be able to judge when fiscal officials have done as much as politics will allow. And that's why in the European crisis, for example, the European Council, the leadership uh, of the European Union, started meeting regularly, monthly, about June of 2010. And it wasn't until that meeting that I referenced earlier in November, December of 2011, that, um, number one, s strategic decisions were made. Number two, how do I know? Britain took its first exception uh, to the communique. And third, Mario Draghi began his extraordinary measures at the ECB because I think he judged that they had finally, on the fiscal political side, taken steps that were as far as they could go and, again, uh, were ahead of the monetary authorities. So I think that um, it is very important to keep these two in close coordination. I always prefer fiscal authorities move first. Um, I would think that um, most central bank governors would prefer that their actions always follow sound fiscal action. Uh, but in the event of a crisis, um, Ben Bernanke first, Mario Draghi uh, later, when he talked about taking all necessary means that were required, recognized that sometimes those banks are the only ones with the balance sheet to keep enough liquidity in the system to give the fiscal authorities time to find the ways in this tortured political system to take the decisions that they need. Dave, very quickly, because so we have time quickly, for one more question. I think the vulnerability, if I were looking at a vulnerability here, it's in Europe, not here in the United States. And, and Mario Draghi did, did say that he was going to take uh, all necessary steps, but he only got the okay from Angela Merkel, the agreement by Angela Merkel to do that when she acted against the advice of the senior Bundesbank officials. And, and so you, I, I think in Europe, there, there is not a lot of structure and balance in the relationship between the fiscal authorities and the monetary authorities. And I think that's, if I were looking to a place wh where, where you could get trouble, that's where I would look. One, one more question. Here, sir. Uh, I'm Hank Gaffney. Sir, sir, microphone's right there. So here we go. I'm Hank Gaffney. Used to work on defense. Knew Bob 30 years ago. I think you were still in uniform, actually, at that point. <laughs> we were selling weapons together. Yeah, right. Um, uh, you know, um, one question of national security is uh, uh, the trouble we're having in, in the U.S. budget and its stagnation, the possibility of continuing resolutions forever, et cetera. Um, now, defense can take these cuts. It's painful, uh, but it... Uh, but they can absorb them, but the rest of the economy is, is going to suffer, especially as they cut all those other discretionary accounts. And sometimes it's mostly about not giving health care to the poor. Uh, but uh, the other thing that's invoked, of course, is the debt. Um, now, when Tom Barnett and I were, began working on globalization in the late 90s, um, with a world GDP of like 60 trillion, maybe, don't hold me to the number, um, we saw 400 trillion in, transaction, in uh, financial transactions taking place a day around the world. Now I think the uh, world GDP is up around 70 or so, and the figure for that is 800 or 900 trillion of, of transactions, all leveraged very highly. So the question was asked over here about um, another financial crisis happening with all this loose money. 
um, going around and not enough regulations, um, that that is probably the greatest threat to American national security in any military sense that exists today. Uh, what's the possibility of getting that all that under regulation? Let's go lightning answers here with all three of you. Bob. Um, Hank, I actually think that um, since the financial crisis, uh, with the work that's been done in the U.S., um, the work that's been done abroad, and particularly the central role played by the Financial Stability Board, it used to be a forum, now it's a formal board of the G20, chaired by Mark Carney, the Canadian who is the new central bank governor in the U.K., um, has done a very good job working alongside other groups like the Basel Committee and so forth to go particularly at that point you mentioned on leverage. I think you'd actually find uh, the leverage um, is down, uh, capital is up, transparency, as Danny said, is significantly up. Having said that, as I mentioned, those global imbalances are still around. We have to get at both our budget and trade deficit. We've got to get the Chinese currency valued on a market basis, and we need to see more growth on the demand side, both in, in Europe and Japan. I think it is those global imbalances that, again, preexisted and survived the crisis that are the greatest threat. And on our side, I agree with Mike Mullen that it's how we deal with our debt. And one way we deal with it is not by increasing it as fast as we've done before. And good news is, again, our deficits are dropping. David, quickly. Well, regulators are, are never going to be able to keep up with innovations in the f financial system, but I think Bob's points are I, absolutely right. I think we're absolutely in a safer place, and, and the institutions to, to monitor all of this have been really enhanced in, in their capabilities. Danny? Let me just say one thing, Wimba. I'm more concerned, I mean, as a good Republican, I'd like to see less regulation than more regulation. But what concerns me right now, Hank, is regulatory uncertainty. And we have a whole series of regulatory projects coming out of Dodd-Frank and other laws that are stalled. It's because of political reasons in the United States. But you find, as you talk to foreign investors or U.S. businesses, U.S. businesses have more cash on their balance sheets now than at any time in U.S. history, over a trillion dollars. And the reason they're not investing into the economy is because of regulatory, legal, and tax uncertainty. You know where I would come out on all those issues, but I would just like us to come out somewhere, because once the businesses understand where the floor is, they'll pivot off of that and put that private capital in, which in my view is the key to finding that missing 1% of growth. Just a, just a comment on that. I understand Wall Street has poured 200 million in lobbying to stop and kill Dodd-Frank. Well, Dodd-Frank has been passed. It's the law of the land. I think well, the question the now, I, I think now it's how it's being um, uh, implemented. And my feeling is, look, lobbying goes on all the time. At the end of the day, let's make some decisions. Uh, even if I don't agree with the decisions, I will applaud the decision having been made so that then people can uh, adjust their investment uh, uh, decisions to practical certainty rather than the uncertainty we have now. Wonderful. On that lively note, let me, uh, let me ask you to thank uh, the panelists, uh, Bob, David, Danny, thank you very much. Great. Danny, great Enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you. Really good.